Again, thank you all for being here. Um, it's great to see your faces and thank you for those terrific, um, wonderful prayers and words of inspiration from our Heavenly Father. So this morning I wanna talk about um, Psalms of Trust. For those of you, and I, oh, I wanted to make a personal request to that during this teaching, if you would please refrain from chatting. Uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback. It's very distracting. It's distracting to me as a teacher. It's distracting to those who are trying to follow. Um, we have an open floor time at the end of the teaching every Sunday, and you will, you'll have undoubtedly have insights, things to add or whatever. And my request this morning is that you hold those for that time rather than chatting during, during the teachings. So I thank you for um, abiding by that request. So those of you who have um, regularly been on these fellowships and have heard me teach over the past couple months, you know that I am on a personal quest about my own trust in my heavenly father. And um, trust and faith, uh, somewhat synonymous, and I'll explain a little more about that later. Um, and I, I've been working on a personal project. What did Jesus say about trust or faith? And I, I'm into it three gospels deep, um, but I honestly felt that I'm not prepared enough to, to address that this morning. There's a lot of wonderful um, and challenging verses that I've, I've come across in that study. So you can look to that in the future. Although when I was still trying to think about, wow, I ought to try, you know, teach some of that this Sunday, I thought, well, maybe I ought to really ask the Lord, you know, what, what else is there that you want me to teach? And I prayed and as usually happens, didn't really get much of a clear <laughs> answer about it. But what did happen is the next morning, I woke up reciting Psalm 23. And I love that Psalm, I've memorized it, so it's not that weird that I would wake up reciting it. And I asked me, well, what does that have to do with trust? You know, thinking about teaching from Psalm 23, well, what, what does that have to do about trust? And it was like, are you kidding? <laughs> it's a Psalm of all these wonderful promises do I believe it? Do I really believe that Yahweh is my shepherd? Do I really believe that he takes care of me like he describes in this wonderful psalm? So that kind of set me on the path of preparing for this. And then I stumbled into the psalm, You Are My Hiding Place. Very simple lyrics that are repeated over and over. And the lyrics are, You are my hiding place. You always fill my heart with songs of deliverance whenever I am afraid. I will trust in you. Let the weak say I am strong in the strength of the Lord. That's the lyric and it repeats through the song. And as I was looking at that, I thought that, that has to come straight from the Psalms. And it does. So I'm gonna start with Psalm 32. And we're going to read a handful of verses in other Psalms, and then we're going to come back to Psalm 23 and really look at that one phrase by phrase. So um, you are my hiding place. You always fill my heart with songs of deliverance. Look at Psalm 32 in uh, verse 7. And I am reading from the revised English version which is Spirit and Truth Fellowship's own um, project of, of translation. Uh, John Shaneheit and a team of Hebrew and Greek scholars are working with him to actually produce this version of the Bible, um, you know, based on a great deal of uh, accuracy. And it's a wonderful project to do, especially in this day and time when there's so much um, data about manuscripts that have been found um, through software and that kind of thing. So this is um, more accessible to do than it has been in the past. Um, so anyway, I'm reading from the revised English version 
And that verse seven says, you're a covering for me. You will guard me from distress. You will surround me with ringing cries of deliverance, Selah. In the King James, it reads, thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with songs of deliverance. So the first couple phrases in that, in that song. And then if you hop to Psalm 13, um, you know, but I trust in you is the next phrase. I will trust in you. And in Psalm 13, verse three, consider and answer me, O Yahweh, my God, and lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him, lest my adversaries rejoice when I am shaken. And this is David's song, one of David's psalm. And we know that he had many adversaries and he spent a number of years in flight before he finally came back to um, Bethel and Ju Jerusalem in Judea and was able to establish his kingdom. But in verse five, he says, but I trust. I trust in your covenant faithfulness. My heart will rejoice in your deliverance. I will sing to Yahweh because he has dealt bountifully with me. And covenant faithfulness, if you're reading from another version of the Bible, you might see that translated as mercy. You might see it as kindness, loving kindness. The Hebrew word uh, that in the REV is translated covenant faithfulness is Chesed. <laughs> if you were to transliterate that into English letters, it would look like C-H-E-S-I-D. And it is a word in Hebrew that has a very broad range of meaning, which is why you see it translated so many different ways. But when the translation team of Spirit and Truth looked at that word, they, they arrived at the phrase covenant faithfulness because it encompasses everything that God said he was and everything that he promised and reflects back the, the truth that God cannot, cannot break his covenant with his people. So that's, that's the meaning of the phrase covenant faithfulness, and we'll see it again this morning. Then the next phrase, um, let the weak say, I am strong. Um, hop over to Psalm 73, and we're going to go down to verse 25. Whom do I have in the heavens? And there is no one on earth. Sorry, just, there's no one on earth whom I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart grow weak, but God is the rock of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who depart from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who act like a prostitute toward you. But as for me, the nearness of, nearness of God is good for me. I have made Yahweh, Lord Yahweh, my refuge, that I may recount all your works. Thinking about that for a minute, um, the phrase all those who act like a prostitute toward you. What an unusual attention getting phrase, um, colorful. And, it, you know, so it grabbed my attention. I thought, wow, that's, that's worth kind of really thinking about there. Um, what is, how do people act like prostitutes toward God? Well, um, by being disingenuous by making lying commitments, uh, by attempting to deceive our Heavenly Father. You know, think about that. Do people do that? Absolutely. Do very religious people do that? You know, absolutely they do. But then he says in, in verse 28, I have made the Lord Yahweh my refuge.
We'll give her a couple of seconds. That I may recount all your. Do you um, get to know him through prayer? Do you get to know him through just reading? Um, one of the things that George Mueller rep repeated in his writings frequently was that when he spent his time, he called it communion with the Lord, which was some combination of prayer and reading and study and prayer and pondering, that he did that with a view toward changing his behavior. It wasn't just to fill his head full of a lot of verses and stuff like that, but it was to read, to um, ingest with a view toward changing his behavior. And I, I love that. One of the things that really stood out to me in reading about him and his work. So I have made, how did David do this? And is the, let me make sure this is David. No, it's Asaph, Asaph. I have made the Lord Yahweh my refuge that I may recount all your works. You're not going to be able to do that if you don't read about them, right? <laughs> That's how we know. That's how we learn about our Heavenly Father. So I just love that. Let, let the weak say I am strong. We strengthen ourselves in our God by getting to know him and know who he is to us and things that he have done, has done for his people all through history. But ironically, that phrase, let the weak say I am strong, and that, that phrase is in a couple of other praise and worship songs that you might know. One of them is give thanks. Um, that let the weak say I am strong is a phrase in that song. The real verse that that comes from literally is Joel. So let's, let's take a quick look at that. Because um, it's kind of remarkable. Oops. Okay, it's in Joel chapter 3. The, the book of Joel is predominantly about the, the future end times, specifically the Battle of Armageddon, which in our eschatology, we believe there is the rapture that gathers together the Christian church, and then the period of tribulation, seven years of tribulation, which closes with the Battle of Armageddon which is followed by Christ establishing his kingdom on earth. And Joel is really, although it was written, you know, thousands of years ago, is really about the battle of Armageddon and the judgment that immediately follows it. And in Joel chapter three, verse nine, um, proclaim, now this is, it's a little complicated, but this is as if Yahweh is speaking to the evil armies who are going to surround Jerusalem, which is, well, Valley, um, Valley of Megiddo, actually, is Armageddon. That's where it's going to take place. That's north of Jerusalem just a little bit. But the armies are going to surround Israel. Um, evil, pagan, Gentile, unbelieving, God-rejecting, <laughs> Um, people are going to populate these armies, and this, these couple of verses are uh, Yahweh speaking to those armies and saying, "Let's come on, let's do it. Strengthen yourselves. Let's do it. So he says in verse 9, proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Stir up the mighty men. Let all the warriors draw, draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plow blades into swords and your pruning hooks into swords into spears, let the weak say, I am strong. And that's, that's Yahweh, it's almost like a taunt, sort of. But he's, he's like inviting these evil armies to, to gather, let's, let's come, let's do this battle. And then in the next verse, um, it's more like, now it's the prophet speaking. And I realize this is kind of complicated and hard to see. So I'm, I invite you to come back, <laughs> study it. If you're reading the REV, read John's commentary behind some of these verses. It'll be very clarifying to you. As a matter of fact, you can even Google it. If you Google the phrase, let the weak say I am strong, you'll get this that I'm explaining. Um, hurry and come, all you surrounding nations. This is verse 11 and gather yourselves together, cause your mighty ones to come down there. 
oh, Yahweh. So now the shift is, you know, Yahweh's mighty ones are going to come and join in this battle. And then quickly after that battle is a judgment, which is where the, the verses go from there. So that, that is the phrase, let the weak say, I am strong. I, it's, um, it's interesting that, um, uh, you know, musicians, authors of, of song and whatever have pulled that phrase out um, and use it to, to gird up God's believers now. And, and, you know, it's highly appropriate in my mind. Um, and then the final phrase, uh, in the strength of the Lord. And so look, let's look at Psalm 28. And then right after this, we're going to get to Psalm 23. But Psalm 28, verses 7 and 8, Yahweh is my strength and my shield. Notice, my strength and my shield. My heart has trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, my heart rejoices. I will praise him with my song. So that's, that's just a few of the roots of that song, You Are My Hiding Place, reflected from the book of Psalms. So now let's look at Psalm 23, and this is where I really wanted to, to spend some time this morning. And a, a lot of what I am going to talk about in the details of this psalm um, came to me through a wonderful gift given to me by Dave and Carol DeMars. Thank you. Um, it was a book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. And the author, and I don't have his name at my fingertips, um, has written many books, but he was for a period of his life a shepherd. Um, and so he writes about the psalm kind of phrase by phrase as how a shepherd would look at it. And this is a psalm of David. And he's writing, Yahweh is my shepherd. David was a shepherd. David's father was a shepherd. All of David's brothers were shepherds before they went to war. Um, David was the youngest of all of his sons. So he was the last shepherd in the family. And um, he knew he was a good one. His father was a good one. He, you know, he, he understood very clearly the demands of being a shepherd, the skills required, um, the, the watchfulness required, the diligence, and so forth. And so the, it just gives the psalm so much more depth and meaning when you think about it. this is a shepherd writing about his God as his shepherd. So there's really wonderful, rich depth in this. And as I was reading it, this isn't a psalm just about the shepherd, the great shepherd. It's a psalm about sheep as well and how sheep behave and um i have a friend who <laughs> whose father was a large animal veterinarian so he took care of horses cows pigs sheep you know what whatever other animal some uh, llamas you know <laughs> alpacas whatever other animal a, a farmer or a, you know a husbandman might have and his, his comment about which sheep was that of the whole group, they're the dumbest. They, and, and what he meant by that was that sheep have absolutely no foresight. So think about us as humans. I mean, there's, there's a lot of times when we have absolutely lack of foresight. <laughs> so Anyway, we'll, and we'll see kind of both sides of, of the psalm as we, as we go through it. Um, but what is wonderful about sheep and why we are compared to sheep, God's people have been compared to sheep all throughout the Bible, is because sheep um, are coachable and they are willing to follow. So all they, although they may have lack of foresight, um, which would also be like lack of wisdom. Um, they are coachable and really willing to follow. Um, contrast that to goats. Goats are independent. They're cantankerous. They're problematic. Um, and, and when we get into our sharing time after the teaching, I'll share with you a short story about um, a, um, a mariner who solo circumnavigated the globe and a, and a goat on his journey. But anyway, that's for later. Um, but so, so anyway, sheep are coachable and, and you know, basically um, 
teachable. And, and that's us. So yeah, but Yahweh is my shepherd. I will not lack. Why will I not lack? Why do the sheep not lack? Because the shepherd understands the demands of the care. And a good shepherd is courageous, strong, physically strong, I mean, uh, confident, diligent, fast acting in order to where um, ward off predators, they're aware, they're perceptive. These are just some of the adjectives that came to my mind as I was looking at shepherds throughout the scripture. Um, when you think about the shepherds at the birth of Christ, they were persuasive communicators and obedient listeners as well. Um, you know, I think of scriptures, and I'm going to allude to several other scriptures about shepherds as we go through this, but um, John 10, you know, Jesus's words, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. So the shepherd are also their protectors, their watchmen, their providers, and their veterinarians as well. We'll see that later in the psalm. So I will not lack the next phrase. He makes me to lie. He makes me lie down in green pastures. So what do sheep do before they lie down in the green pastures? <laughs> they eat. So here we have the provision of their food, which obviously they can't live without. So, um, you know, think about the Lord's prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, we are instructed to pray for our daily sustenance, to have our, our food needs met. And then what happens when their bellies are full, they'll lie down in those pastures, but sheep will not lie down if they're anxious. If they're anxious, they stay standing, they shuffle around and they warily watch for attackers. But when they're not anxious, when they're at peace, there, they will lie down in those pastures. And again, I think about John 14, the um, part of Jesus's instruction in the Lord's Supper, um, peace I leave with you. This is verse 27, and I'm quote, gonna memorize, I have it memorized in the King James. So peace I leave with you, uh, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So sheep that are taken care of by the good shepherd, the great shepherd, are not anxious and lie down. He leads me beside still waters. So we had food, now we have water. Um, but also, if, if water, why, why still waters? Because if water is too swift, um, the sheep will, they'll be afraid of it and won't drink. They'll walk, they'll, you know, go, thirsty uh, before they will take that risk. Sheep are not risk takers. <laughs> um, sheep will, if a shepherd is leading sheep to good water, good clean water, and there's mud puddles in between, a, a sheep will drink out of dirty water, parasite infested water, even when the clean water is in sight. So it's up to the shepherd to prevent them from doing that and to guide them to where the still waters are and the, the waters that are healthy and good for them. Um, so he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Restores my soul. How does he do that with sheep? Well, <laughs> you know, to me, this is about rest. How many how many promises are there in Psalms and Proverbs about our sleep being sweet and restful? He restores our soul. He provides us rest, shelter, comfort. It's a very intimate phrase, in my opinion. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And in this wonderful book that the Demars sent me, the author talks about, you know, sheep have to be constantly on the move. And especially in the Old Testament days in Israel, 
because there's a rainy season, November to March, and then it doesn't rain from March to November. So the vegetation dries up and so do the water supplies. So the shepherds had to know, they had to know the land, they had to know where there was food, where there was water, and, and it was constantly changing throughout the year. Um, the, the country that the author of that book was a shepherd in, I'm, I'm thinking it was New Zealand maybe, or maybe it was one of the European countries. But anyway, he, he had the same situation, not necessarily rainy season, dry season, but the need to constantly be moving the sheep to high land, to low land and, and back and forth. And the sheep would learn the path and they would tend to take the same paths. And when you go to Israel, you can see this in the scruffy areas of the hill country and the wilderness. You can see visibly, even from a distance, the paths that the sheep have worn. So he, he leads me um, in paths of, of righteousness. So sheep get to know the, the pathways, um, but also this is our God and he leads us, those pathways lead us to right living. We have to be diligent to stay on the path, but those paths will lead us to righteousness. Our job is to, to walk those paths and to listen to the shepherd. And then the phrase, for his name's sake. Isn't that interesting? He restores my soul. He guides, guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What is that about? Well, shepherds had to protect their reputations. So, you know, a shepherd who was diligent, um, who was careful, who was the right protector and so forth. It, when his sheep were prospering, people would credit the shepherd, right? Because sheep can't do it on their own. So then the question I asked myself is, wow, is my life crediting the shepherd? When people watch my conduct, hear my speech and my words, am I crediting the great shepherd? So for his name's sake, his reputation's sake. And how did Jesus open the, the prayer we call the Lord's Prayer? You know, Father, let your name be recognized as holy on this earth. If you're reading from another version, you would see, you know, hallowed is by name. That's King James English. It doesn't mean much to us culturally, I don't think right now. But let your, let your reputation, let your name be regarded as holy on this earth. And we all have a part in getting that done. And then even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, so on those pathways, when in the low portions of those pathways and in the lower pastures that were down between valleys, and especially if the valley was around, you know, if the hillsides were steep, there would be shadows covering those pathways at different times of the day. And what's lurking in the shadows? Predators, wolves, in David's time, lions. Um, they, were, they were all there. So, um, and the sheep are susceptible to predators. They're, <laughs> they wouldn't know which way to run. Um, they're not real fast and, and steady on their feet, nothing like a deer um, or other animals like that. And so it's the shepherd's job to anticipate and to ward off and to recognize sheep are in the shadows. And I need to be especially alert at that time. And speaking from the sheep's perspective, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Um, in spite of their lack of foresight, sheep do have a sense of when, when they're being cared for because they want to follow, they want to be coached, they want to be led. And then your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What comfort from a rod and a staff? So let's talk about those things. You know, when the shepherds were with the sheep um, in the fields, and they were there day and night. They had like anchor campsites that they would go back to, but a lot of times they were on these trails chasing water and food. They had to be able to carry with them just everything they would need themselves too. 
And two of the key things that a shepherd always carried were the rod and the staff. So what is what are those? Well, the staff is that long, very famous, you see it in pictures all over the place, um, with a hook on the end, a long staff with a, with a hook on the end. And what did the shepherd do with that? Um, he would use the staff to keep the sheep together in the flock. If one wandered off, he could just gently tap it on the shoulder. And that's really the predominant way that they used the staff. It wasn't, the, the hook wasn't the main thing. It was just being able to tap the sheep gently to get them back into the flock because a wandered off sheep is, is prey. Um, so anyway, and I, I think on occasion, if the sheep were um, insistent, uh, which um, is definitely reflected in, in the book that I'm referring to, um, he could hook them by the leg and get them to fall and then kind of get them to stand up and go back to the, to the sheep, I mean, to the, to the flock. Um, so that's the staff. And then the rod, the rod was actually not something they used on the sheep. The rod was an offensive weapon that could be thrown at a predator. So think about that picture a wolf racing toward you know, a flock of sheep, he's going to single out the weakest lamb or whatever one is nearest and, and, and drag it off. And the shepherd being able to throw that rod and, and knock out a wolf. And so it's, it was the thing of amazing skill. And often when the shepherds were in their quiet time and in proximity to other shepherds, they would have contests of who could throw the rod most accurately, who could throw the rod the farthest and all of that. So um, that was really fun for me to learn about that, that the rod, you know, it's not something they beat the sheep with. Um, it was something that they used to fend off predators. So that's how the rod and the staff comfort the sheep. And then you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I. I love that phrase because what it doesn't say is you get rid of all my enemies and then you prepare a table for me. And this came out, Len, in, in your beautiful prophecy, um, all around us is a storm. And we are going to be in that storm until the Lord returns. You know, we, we are instructed over and over again in scripture to anchor our souls with our hope, right? And we, in spirit and truth, define that as the rapture and, and the millennial kingdom that follows the period of tribulation is, in, um, you know, the beautiful descriptions of the millennial kingdom. God put them in the Bible for a reason that we could have that hope and have it hold our souls. But so the phrase, you know, come quickly, Lord Jesus, um, shouldn't be a phrase of desperation. It is a phrase of hope, but not a phrase of des desperation, because our great shepherd prepares us a table in the presence of our enemies, which means we're eating, he's watching. And not only he, but certainly our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we watch out for each other. Um, we learn to take care of each other and watch out for each other as well. So you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The spiritual battle is certainly raging all around us and seems um, by all things to um, you know, be escalating quite a bit. Oh, I want to go back. I want to go back to verse four because um, I forgot a point that's really, I hope you'll find um, important. The phrase, I will fear no evil for you are with me. And I want you to go to Proverbs three. Um, we're going to look at verses 25 and 26. When I was preparing this teaching, the phrase kept coming to my mind, don't be afraid of sudden fear, which is kind of, a, again, that's more King James translation. And I looked and looked and looked for it. Finally, I thought it was in Timothy somewhere. And then I thought, I must have made that up. 
And then I, th I finally found it here in Proverbs, but and th this is so important. Proverbs um, 3, verse 25, do not be afraid of sudden terror and of the destruction of the wicked when it comes. For Yahweh will be your confidence and he will keep your foot from being caught. Do not be afraid of sudden terror. And my encouragement to you, something that I've worked hard on in my life, is figure out what causes you fear. Figure out what causes you to tremble and get rid of it from your life. For me, it's news. I just realized with what everything that's going on in the world and the country, and I get stuff sent to me from all kinds of different angles, you know, about all, all kinds of stuff, globalism, eugenicism, um, if that's the way you say that, uh, the great reset, you know, all this stuff. And I would find myself just, you know, you hear something and then just being gripped with it. And I thought, no, I can't allow this in my life. So I honestly just, I, I get some news because my wonderful spouse, Dave, listens to news, but um, I will even leave the room if I sense it's something that is gonna um, really shake my trust, shake my faith. So that's the, I will fear no evil bit. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the devastation of the wicked when it comes. Back to Psalm 23. So that's the, I will fear no evil. And then we did table in the presence of the enemies. You anoint my head with oil in verse five. And oil um, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the gospel, well, I guess even through the New Testament, actually, um, oil soothes and it cleanses. And a, a, she, a shepherd of sheep, you know, think about very thick wool, um, but sheep are very susceptible to skin disease. And in order for the sheep to be healthy and for the shepherd to be able to shear good wool, um, he needs to be very aware of those skin diseases on his sheep. And they, so they would anoint with oil and then pick, you know, it helps separate the hair and then pick through and really examine the scalp and the, the rest of the body of the sheep to make sure it was free of, of any kind of um, disease or parasites that would, would live in the wool. So anointing um, the head of the sheep with oil was a way of cleansing and soothing and a way of practicing veterinary medicine actually. <laughs> And my cup runs over is to me an expression of plenty, um, abundance, no lack. Um, surely goodness and covenant faithfulness will pursue me all the days of my life. And there again is that beautiful Hebrew word chesed, um, covenant faithfulness, that God will absolutely not break his promises of care for us. And it's with us all the days of our lives. And we will dwell in Yahweh's house for my length of days. And in this day and time, we are, I'm looking at Yahweh. His house, right? So, but anyway, so we, we are Yahweh's house. We are the body of Christ. Um, and so... You know, let's dwell there in the body of Christ. Let's think about what does that really mean? The lot to say about how we're supposed to take care of each other. So let's get it in gear and take care of each other. So we dwell in, in Yahweh's house. We dwell in the body of Christ for our length of days. So that, that is the psalm. That's how it spoke to me. And I'll, I'll challenge you like I challenged myself. Um, do you trust these promises? Do you trust them for yourself? A lot of times we, it's easy to say, you know, oh, these apply to everybody. I can see it, that they apply to everybody else. But do you trust that they apply to you, that they are for you, and that Yahweh is indeed your shepherd? 
and will cause you not to laugh. So that's what I wanted to share this morning. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being here. And we'll open the floor for any comments, any um, questions, any insights that came up for you. Um, feel free. This is your time. <laughs>